graduate, uh, quite recent, from UNC North Carolina Charlotte. Uh, she's been working on the RPC project as one as our lead project coordinator um, and will be transitioning uh, to kind of uh, uh, sort of stepping back from that those everyday coordination to do more of the overall sort of visioning and support and research of the model in her new role. Uh, community psychologist, health psychologist by training and uh, a key partner in all of this and developer of many of the materials that you'll see here today. So uh, welcome Taylor and glad to have you here. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for the warm introduction. I'm so excited to see the good turnout. Thanks for having an interest in what I'm doing and working on with Max. It's um, been really great working uh, with Max and through the National Prevention Science Coalition to try and find ways to bridge connections between researchers and legislative offices. And so that's primarily what I'll be talking about today. Um, and a lot of the slides that I'll have here today also come from originally the content was developed for our capacity development side of the model where we help to train researchers for interacting with legislative officials and their staff. Um, one of the things that we know is that um, a, a systematic review in particular found that one of the most important facilitators for research to policy translation is personal contact between these communities. Um, so in overview, I'll talk more about our model and what we seek to do in this um, process. And I'll give you a bit more rationale after that in terms of our choice points, including the barriers and facilitators of uh, evidence-based policy, which includes some of these highlighted bullets here, like trusting relationships, um, the cultural differences between these communities, and um, ways that we can work to build trusting relationships and communicate effectively, sort of unlearning science talk. Um, and third, we'll talk more about the legislative process and avenues for engagement for researchers. Um, so with the research to policy collaboration model, uh, we're aiming to better understand policymakers' needs uh, and respond to those in a timely manner. Um, I'll talk more about this in a moment, but we know that these are um, helpful processes in terms of the translation process. And we sort of have two different groups that we seek to work with independently and then bring them together in collaboration, and that is researchers and policymakers. So on the researcher side, we look to develop capacity um, and we look for opportunities to engage them with legislative offices. Um, with policymakers, we better we look to understand their needs, which kind of contrasts with some of the other translational models where sometimes you have research synthesis of, you know, this is my really interesting research and here, let me tell you about it. Or this is the sort of things that you should be doing instead of that uh, approach of advocacy and telling legislators what we think they should be doing. We start with what they're currently interested in and try to build out from there with the science. Um, and so that makes it timely and relevant. Um, so the third string, the third strand is this ongoing collaboration between these two groups. And uh, it's important to have these connections, not just for this trust and understanding, but also we know that um, research to policy is, um, we actually need a more bi-directional approach. Not only do we need policymakers to better understand research, but as researchers, we need to better understand their needs and how to communicate it in a way that works for them. What sorts of research questions should we be asking and et cetera. Um, and so here's our logic model of the RPC. Um, what I'll talk about primarily in a moment are, hmm, but I had, oh yes, I do have two. I'll talk about primarily this network development and capacity. Uh, with the research response network, that's a for, first step with our researcher intervention, where we work with um, organizations that have membership networks to identify people who might have substantive expertise relevant to a topic of focus. We identify those topics of focus based on the opportunities in the policy arena. I'll describe a little bit more about that later on. Um, 
and I'll also get to this policy arena later on. In overview, though, we identify needs and we identify them sort of long term with this policy issue identification and then the legislative needs assessment is more short term. Um, I'll talk now about how we seek to build that capacity among researchers and how we work with researchers to respond to the needs and interests of policymakers. So our rapid response network, um, we, we know that um, we're not experts in everything. It's not possible to be. And so I, whenever I explain my role, I sort of often say, you know, I have breadth knowledge and my role is to try and identify people who know a lot more than I do about whatever you're interested in. And so we rely on experts to share their expertise and we identify potential experts who want to get involved through membership and affiliate organizations. Um, we also know that building capacity among a research network is important because a lot of formal training programs don't help us to understand how to directly engage in the policy arena. Um, we learn a lot about how to do the science talk and less about the translation, and that's not uniform across programs by any means. But overall, we know that um, there's few opportunities for most researchers to learn and become confident in these sorts of skills for translation, as well as uh, opportunities for direct engagement. Um, and so <coughs> we also, um, sometimes we might have skills that transfer to the policy arena, but we might be uh, unfamiliar with the process and uncom not confident enough to engage, like where do you start? And so that's sort of what we seek to do in this competency building skill development um, aspect of our model is to better help researchers prepare in a way that makes it seem less scary and intimidating because ultimately the folks on Capitol Hill, I mean, most of them are about my age and they're not very intimidating at all. So you just need to schedule a meeting and figure out how to do that and who to contact. Um, so I also talk, talked about learning unlearning science talk. I have a slide on that later on as well. Um, with our model, we really sought to build on this concept of knowledge brokering, which um, these sorts of individuals convey research in a timely, relevant manner using unbiased research with policymakers. So they first identify needs and then try to convey that research. But our model is a bit different in that we're looking to mobilize researchers instead of it just being one staff or a handful of staff who are engaging in these knowledge brokering roles. We're seeking to develop these competencies among our researcher network. And so um, we think that this is particularly important because we know that knowledge brokering has the potential to improve these trusting relationships that increase the likelihood that research gets used in policy. <clears throat> Um, so with the rapid response network, or sorry, with the rapid response it sort of comes at the end of our model and even really throughout the process of building relationships, we emphasize that um, this is not a one-time meeting. If you're looking to build a relationship and a trusting relationship, you need to have ongoing collaboration. And so whenever you have, we have meetings, we emphasize that it's not about the meeting, it's about the follow-up. And so the meetings themselves are usually pretty brief, 15 to 30 minutes, and you outline what you have some brief discussion and outline next steps for collaboration. And that follow up is really critical. Um, so when those responses or those requests from legislative offices take different forms um, that might take the form of synthesizing research evidence, it might be um, reviewing legislative language, holding an event on Capitol Hill to describe the state of the research, or um, even written more public facing uh, opportunities for communication. Um, so with that, we solicit, whenever we receive a request, my first gut reaction is, I'm not the expert. I'm not going to try and address this directly myself. I'm going to find the people who are best equipped to do that because it's most efficient to do that and it provides an opportunity for engagement among people who generally just want to make sure their research matters. Um, and so along the way that uh, eventually leads to opportunities for directly connecting with those offices in more deliberation and um, sometimes that's phone meetings, sometimes that's face-to-face. -face. 
the rapid response event is face-to-face. -face. So that is essentially once we have identified needs and we've identified the relevant expertise to address legislators' needs, we bring them together at a rapid response event where they meet face-to-face -face and have a concerted strategic planning opportunity to identify how to address those needs. And uh, whenever that rapid response event when we're identifying those matches because you know we might have a vast rapid response network we have to figure out who's the best fit and that depends on their needs and the research the legislators needs and the researchers expertise and how that match happens that's first and foremost of course availability matters too especially the ability to commit time because if you don't have the ability to follow up because you're overwhelmed and working 80 hours at your job that's totally understandable but that's something that we need to make sure is part of the process that you're able to commit that time um, so i wanted to pause for a second before i go on to the next segment where i'll talk more about some of the rationale of why relationships matter and things like that to see if you guys have any questions so far it helps to unmute but yeah. it helps. Hi, does anyone at Hershey have any questions? It's okay if you don't. I just wanted to do a process check. I have a quick question. Yeah, sure. Um, and I may have missed this, um, but when you're starting out and you're looking at legislative needs, are you hearing from the legislators themselves? Are they coming to you? Or do you hear from researchers who are talking to you and asking you to find out which legislators might have a need based on them. So where does, where does this all start? Generally, it starts with the legislative offices. We don't meet with legislators themselves most of the time just because they are expected to be experts in, in attending to so many issues. That's what their staff are for. So we'll, you know, in the child welfare context, we'll identify the staff who handles child and family issues and things like that. Um, does that answer your question? I mean, sometimes I think we have gotten requests before to better assess which offices are interested in certain topics, but generally our approach with RPC is to first start with the legislators. So, so you, would you start with um, legislation that you know is in the works and then sometimes. you ID those legislators or do you look at um, individual legislators and just kind of track, well, these people are interested in all these things, so if it ever comes up, I know who yeah. to contact. Sometimes, I, sometimes we have legislation that we know is in the works that might benefit from consult, or sometimes we just know that there's legislators that are part of caucuses, which are essentially interest groups, if they are working on things, because we can really get involved at any stage of the policy development process. So if they're really thinking like, what are the policy solutions from scratch, then, you know, we wouldn't be able to detect that from just looking at existing um, introduced legislation. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else? I don't know if you're going to get to this later, sure. but you mentioned that it's important to address what the legislators are already interested in. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering, do you ever come up against or try to combat the idea that we know that things like the NIH are kind of swayed towards the pet causes of mm -hmm. the people who do control that funding and it's often not the diseases or conditions that affect the most amount of people. Do you try to ever sway people that aren't originally interested in something? Do you have any kind of... So if I'm understanding what you're saying, you're talking about like the NIH has sort of their own interests and that's how they fund projects, but... Are you, do you mean congressional offices? Yeah. Like right. you try to change the sort of priorities of an office. Right, because you're saying you meet people where they are. Right. But that might not necessarily reflect like the healthcare needs of the right. general population. So I think we try to move the needle sometimes. We have really broad based discussion. If we talk about opiates and they want to address the opiate epidemic with, you know, reducing access and availability, I'll also mention that there are preventative approaches to um, assess the likelihood that youth gets involved and have have an intervention that happens before there's even demand for that opioid. Does that help answer that question? So often they'll drive the conversation in terms of they do they may have a 
general area and outcome focus. They want to stop child abuse or they want to stop drug abuse or something like that. Okay. But they'll have also notions of how to do that. And so we bring the science to bear and sort of say like, this is where there's a confluence of scientific knowledge around effective strategies. Mm -hmm. And so we share that with them and sometimes that aligns and sometimes it doesn't. So if their ideas or focus are incongruent with what we know is sort of the most you know, damaging. And so your point about the NIH, yes, NIH does make, you know, focuses on, for instance, certain types of cancer that are actually not the most, you know, costly or, you know, have the greatest morbidity or mortality rates, but because it's, you know, something that has been, you know, there's a constituency behind it, they, it gets more money. And so we don't specific, so we, we don't specifically attend to science funding because right. that, that would lead clearly to a conflict of interest on our part. Um, because we're recipients of NIH funding, but uh, but you could imagine where there might be in different situations where we might encourage them to, for instance, you know, put resources towards something that was more about protecting people or the most people or saving most lives or something like that. Mm -hmm. okay. In those interactions, if if they're asking me about topic A, my approach with suggesting anything around topic B isn't, hey, you should think about this. It's, have you heard of this? It's more open-ended to see, you know, to just sort of test the water. Is that something you're aware of? Would you like more re information on it? Um, so that it's sort of not a push. It's still avoiding that push as much as just making sure we're having a conversation about the unlimited possibilities about the interest area we're talking about. Um, so the next segment, I'll talk more about the about the reasons um, behind the RPC model and how we chose some of these points. Uh, it's essentially research about research utilization. So um, why do policymakers use research? And from from that area of research, we know that um, personal contact is a really big deal. And so. If you provide a report to, um, you know, a staff in legislative office, they may or may not read it. Honestly, if I had to project, I would say there's an 80% chance they don't read it. But um, there's, you know, that personal contact helps to not just make that more of a trusting relationship, but it also um, helps to have discussions around the research that you know, it's just different to get information from a person who you can ask questions rather than just a report. Um, we also know that um, the needs and timely relevance is um, a barrier. And if we are more relevant with what research we're talking about, it's more likely to get used, which is sort of intuitive, right? You're working on the opioid epidemic. Let's try and address <laughs> that. You're not currently working on this other topic. So we'll, we'll get to that when <laughs> the opportunity arises. Um, we also face some mistrust, and uh, a part of that is cultural differences. Um, we also know that there is a lack of access to synthesized research sometimes, and actually, I wouldn't even say it's a lack of access at this point. It's just there's so much out there, it's hard to know who to trust and where to get it from, where to start. And so, you know, even if you do write a synthesis, that doesn't mean that the right people are going to get it. So dissemination is also sometimes pretty poor. Um, nevertheless, research synthesis is still part of the process. You know, if you don't have research synthesis, then it's harder to talk about it in um, more broad brush strokes uh, about the state of the evidence. And we also know that collaboration, similar to personal contacts, is, is helpful. Um, so with this next couple of slides, I'm going to talk more about the legislative side, um, talking more about the, the needs of legislators and um, how we seek to um, identify those. And um, I'll also talk more about this on-site event or the rationale behind that. So with relationships, we know that trust goes a long way, but whenever there's so much information out there and so many people banging on your door to make decisions the way that they want you to make decisions, trust is really critical. And so legislative staff are looking for organizations that they think are going to be unbiased and transparent and impartial. Um, you know, they legislators often rely on uh, trusted colleagues and advisors. Expert credentials help, 
but they're not everything. Um, and so having trust is really important. And um, we know that the barriers to that lack of trust include um, include you know this these sort of misconceptions or perceptions about one another, which might be explained by some cultural differences where um, policymakers might be frustrated with something like junk science. They are frustrated about the irrelevance of some science, and um, they want scientists to be able to give a more quick, clear, simple answer sometimes. Um, so sometimes they also are worried that science can be self-serving, you know, publishing on top of publications that aren't, per the perception is that what is the unique benefit of these? Um, and so self-serving in a way that you're looking for funding for quote pointless studies. Um, and so that really contributes to this notion of junk science. Whereas, you know, on our side, we have to be really caught thinking introspectively as well. What do, what do people here think about Congress right now? I mean, national media really paints this vivid picture and controvers a controversial one. I have to say that my interactions on the Hill have actually been really refreshing and that national media covers these really contentious topics, but there are areas of compromise where people are looking to work on things together and those aren't covered by national media. Nonetheless, we have some of perceptions, right? And we know that we might resent, we might tend to resent policymakers' control of the funding or misuse of scientific data to fulfill a policy agenda. And um, sometimes there's uh, this message that we perceive that scientists aren't being respected, you know, hence maybe the science march. Um, and um, that can also send an unintentional message that science might be this on an, uh, this exclusive club. Um, so we know that there are these cultural differences and we know that we're not interacting, but if we were interacting more, maybe we'd be able to overcome some of this mistrust. And part of how, uh, oh, sorry, I have this judgment emoji, this like emoji almost, just because there's a lot of judgment in this area that's contributing to this lack of trust and respect. Um, so um, to that end, we know that not only can interactions potentially help, but we need to be prepared for those interactions and how we can be culturally sensitive. You know, so often I think we as, you know, health professionals talk about cultural competency, but the the same notion uh, rings true here. Um, so mistrust can be driven by a lack of understanding for one another's professional cultures and values. Um, with Congress, a lot of the information they get is from news staff and colleagues. They rely a lot on real world stories, whereas, of course, we like to trust peer reviewed science and our decision making processes can be a bit more linear. Here's the evidence. Just do it right. Um, but policymakers are, you know, they have to sell and advocate and argue for those positions. And ultimately, their job is to serve their constituents. Um, they rely on political capital to get things done, and so it's just not as linear as we'd like it to be. Um, decisions are often the result of compromise, and um, some ideas are just not ready for, po for policy action because there might be a lack of public support or there might be competing policy interests. Um, we also know that policymakers have shorter short-term um, views because of the election cycle. So in terms of their decision-making timeline, it's often much more quickly, whereas researchers have less un uncertainty tolerance. We want to be more deliberative and really um, make an informed decision. Um, so the types of information that policymakers rely on can sometimes be more just in nature. So national polls and things that um, of that nature. I'll, I'll go over the differences in how we define evidence in a moment, too. Um, so in e any case, there's a lot of um, differences, and we know that there's this tendency to focus on what's the best interest of your constituents, which also kind of contrasts with our notion of generalizability, right? So you want to focus on this narrow section of Pennsylvania and how they're focusing on the opioid epidemic. Whereas, you know, that might not generalize to the broader population. Opioids is probably not a great example for generalizability, but um, anyhow, so we have to think more about the policymaker realities. Um, scientists are just one constituent or one voice in this broader process. 
Policymakers have to be responsive to multiple interest groups, um, you know, campaign funders, but especially their voters. So voters trump scientists in that way. Scientists are just one out of this many to one relationship. And um, and so with um, we, it's also important that we recognize, you know, some some realities around um, around how they interact. So I talked about how they have different timelines. Sometimes that's also because of political crises. You know, something like the Sandy Hook shooting can open up a policy window where people try and push different ideas, and you have you know advocates or even the science community has to be prepared for those crises in order to advance those sorts of um, the research that would help to actually address those issues. But when those crises happen, people want immediate answers. We don't have time to wait five years for a study to complete. Um, and so in any case, science is one consideration, but not the entire consideration in these decisions. And emotions and values and outside interests play a large role. Um, so with this approach, we really try and start with common ground because we think that that offers some of the low hanging fruit and it's um, more opportunistic to figure out what are the things that people are already working on. Um, so I, I mentioned I would come back to this. So we define uh, another lived reality that is different for us is the way we define evidence. So um, I won't explain the researcher side of things because I'm sure you guys get it. Um, the one thing that I have read though is that sometimes we have a tendency to over explain limitations and caveats of our research where it's hard to get a simple answer. And I think one way you can sort of work on that is by thinking about it as a body of evidence. You know, the weight of the evidence says blank and making it um, a bit more clear and concrete as to what um, you know, policymakers have a quick take home message that they can share with their constituents and other others for political capital purposes. Um, but generally, policymakers have a much wider view of evidence than we do. They might rely on anecdotes, including constituent stories or their um, own experiences. Um, they also rely on these less formal methods for collecting data like polls and opinion surveys. Um, they're concerned about highlighting knowledge gaps um, on favored solutions. This is sort of a bit of a confirmation bias, right? We want to talk about the research on something that we already know we want to advance. Um, and then they use local data. So that's particularly relevant to, again, that notion of the district. People ask me sometimes, well, is this a problem for my district? They want that local lens. Um, we also know that um, there's a lot of information out there, as I mentioned already, how do you get your message out there when policymakers have so many demands, you know, you have one legislator might be working on issues that range from military spending to um, building bridges to foster care. And so they have different staff for those purposes, but in any case, those demands have increased and are growing. Even the budget for congressional offices has diminished quite substantially since the 1990s. And meanwhile, we have the information age, which you know you now have greater access to being able to email staffers. So they receive hundreds of messages a day, plus social media and all of these multiple sources. People are putting out all these sorts of things on the web and not much is assimilated. And so whenever we, do get our message out there, we also face this issue of how much of it gets read. Um, basically, the most policymakers are not going to read a report in detail, and we're lucky if half of them sort of skim it. Um, we do rely a lot more on staff to learn those details because that's their job to be more of the expert in their office on a topic. Um, in any case, back to the relationship issue, we know that policymakers may read people, but not reports. So those interactions can be helpful for that purpose. Um, and another consideration is that term limits, I mean, while there's advantages and disadvantages on both sides of that political issue, one issue to consider is that legislators working in Congress for a long period of time have had time to develop expertise and substantive positions on different issues. Um, in any case, we know that they're subject to expert lobbyists. 
because we know that um, they have lots of people in their ear. Um, so when you're communicating about research evidence, um, it's helpful to use some of the useful formats and data. I, I'm a community psychologist by training, so I do evaluation reports. We use a lot of these sorts of strategies even in our reports. So I'm sure some of you guys have these skills already. The, you know, bulleted and abbreviated take-home points are really helpful. Graphs and charts can send a message more quickly than a paragraph. Um, and some of the key statistics that legislators look for are things like, what are the public's opinion? What's the public's opinion about that? Especially my district, what do they think about it? Um, how much of a priority is this issue? I've actually had someone ask me before, you know, are we trying to address a problem that's not really a problem, you know, at the federal level? So quantifying the magnitude of of that problem for Congress and the extent to which it's a federal problem has been something we've considered. Um, and I won't beat the last point home uh, relevant to the district level. Um, straightforward language. I think that um, I already mentioned the caveats uh, as being a, an issue, but jargon is also a challenge. And even though we try to unlearn and try and simplify our language, we can still fall into these similar pitfalls like, like meta-analysis. I think most people, if they put time to sit there and really think, what does that mean? They can make sense out of it, but you don't want people to jump through mental hoops in order to understand your message. So you want to simplify your message as much as possible for a take home point, something that legislators can use to, to share with others as a, a point of advocacy. Um, and finally, in addition to science and data, real people are really important. Narrative storytelling is no joke. We had a briefing recently where um, we, you know, Max was one of the speakers, did a great job, and we had lots of data we were presenting on, and everybody really enjoyed it. But I think what people enjoyed the most was hearing from a father who was involved in that program. And it was just, it was emotional, and it was, it, um, it was just touching. And so that's what people walked away saying, make sure you get me that video of that father. Um, so even though we relied on the science to tell the story, we still had that personal narrative. So it wasn't just relying on anecdote, it was using a story to demonstrate the science. Um, so in any case, that makes it more personally relevant and more practical for use and um, more powerful for, for legislators to take that to other people. Um, with relationship strategies, um, a lot of these, I think, kind of come to sort of clinical psychology or therapeutic um, skills in terms of being an active listener. But we do know that we have a listening deficit in our society. Anytime someone's forming, formulating their ideas and we're here, supposed to be hearing them, we're already thinking about what our retort or response is. And so it's hard to truly understand what someone's um, perspective is without sort of making sure you're doing some active listening and being introspective about that um, and reflecting in ways that help to demonstrate that you've heard them. Um, still easier said than done. Um, <laughs> uh, also, non-biased objectivity. Um, we want to make sure we're reporting on things as they are and sticking to the science. The more we talk about our opinions and um, talking about specific potential solutions, um, the more likely they might be perceiving us to have um, an agenda. And we want them to think of us as, at least in the RPC, we want them to think of us as a neutral source of information. And so um, we try to refrain from promoting specific policies. Uh, we also want to make sure to cite sources so that it's not me saying this, look at this body of evidence that's saying this, and here are the full reports if you want to go read those in detail. Um, we also recommend refraining from self-disclosure about political orientation and keeping it pretty neutral. Um, you know, we all have opinions, but that's not our role in the RPC. It's, it's our role is to understand and try and work from where the legislator already is with their values and their, their um, agenda.
Um, it's also important in terms of being transparent. So of course, that's the fine line between self-disclosure and transparency. But in terms of acknowledging your limitations, I think I do this all the time because I constantly am saying I'm not the expert, but I can find people who are. And so if there's an area that's, you know, outside of your expertise, don't be afraid to say so. And that can help to build credibility on its own in that, you know, you might have certain niches of areas of expertise, but you're not going to try and oversell yourself. Um, finally, and most importantly, is that staffers, not the legislators, are the people who you're most likely to interact with. They're the gatekeepers and opinion shapers. They, they have to be treated with utmost respect and gratitude. It's a common mistake to assume that it's better to interact with the elected official rather than their staff. Um, but, you know, they, these staff have a great deal of influence. They're often the ones who are actually writing the legislation, and they're the ones who are informing their boss on the issue. Um, and so now I'll talk a little bit more about the legislative process, but I can pause again for questions. Does anybody have anything they... So one, one comment, yep. a lot of these materials, as Taylor may have already mentioned, um, are drawn from the actual trainings that we do. So six week training that I talked about in the last uh, uh, <coughs> session. And one, one thing that really sticks out in my mind is, is I can remember so clearly this, the point in our training where we talked about body language, right? The way that you kind of hold mm -hmm. yourself in an office and that sometimes staffers will make statements that you are viscerally against right and we um we actually when we had a hill day we brought some of the researchers to to an office and we were talking with an office and um you know the staff was very nice and she kind of made a a statement that at the time a lot of people just you know found so uh, you could tell that you know i knew our people and that, that they would find this idea abhorrent and they really held it together you know because like i mean we knew they weren't going to say anything in response but we didn't know whether they'd be able to kind of keep from wincing in their face or tightening up their body language or those type of things because the you know while these staffers are not scientists or you know or intellectual kind of you know, giants, what they are is very perceptive young people who watch things like that. And so this is part of that engagement piece. Yeah. yeah. I think that really goes back to this notion of lived realities too. And this, you know, these clinical kind of skills of, all right, this is someone else's lived reality and having empathy and positive regard for where they are in their life. Have you all created any personas for the legislator, the, the staffers, the different the gatekeepers that you could share with with folks that would help them with <coughs> the mindset of you know who these people are and what what's behind them. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. the Social Science Research Institute here um, um, is actually supporting the manualization of this model, and so we're definitely including resources that can facilitate you know some of those pieces within the actual training. We actually, we, we bring in either retired staffers or staffers that we have a close relationship with, and they actually do role playing um, in terms of, you know, engaging, you know, in talking about a scientific issue, the staffer will make a request, the person will respond, sometimes they'll, you know, give them a hard time or, you know, those type of things. So we try to, you know, that's a big piece of this is getting people ready for game day when you're actually engaging with these folks because, you, you know, you may see a 20 something year old who's you know sitting there and seems awfully precocious but you know clearly you must make these assumptions about that person and it's a really important to kind of as Taylor said sort of get in in their sort of place and where they are I think another thing to address your question if I'm understanding right is that we develop dossiers of the office oh, yeah. to help prepare people for where the you know that members potential values or their previous voting behavior you know we'll summarize things that are pretty you know they might be contentious issues and irrelevant to our topic but it at least gives a sense of the political flavor of the person um, but we also summarize our notes about the previous conversations that we've done through the needs assessments so we'll we'll say you know this is something that the office is interested in and they're a little bit wary about this that kind of thing to kind of prepare people. Yeah, the persona though 
looks more at the attitudes, the beliefs, the behaviors of the person, not necessarily what they're, you know, the topic area that they're interested in, but kind of like who's behind this person. So you can make those connections better. Yeah. No, it's a, I think a general general person is, is a useful is a useful tool. As Sally said, we, we do put together these pretty in-depth dossiers, and like one piece of information I like to know is how much does this person make? It's all public yeah. information, and it puts things in context. When yeah. you see this is well, this is someone who just graduated from college and is not going to be making very much. Not to mention staffers haven't gotten a cost of li living raise or anything in, in decades. Right, so they make actually nothing, and they do it for a lot of other reasons. And so it's very interesting to think about like what this this person probably has roommates and is living in DC and you know exactly. it's, it's yep. totally in the bubble, right? You know. So yep. anything else before I move to the next section? All right. So um, in terms of engaging in the legislative process, I first wanted to go over some definitions of advocacy. I put this umbrella on the screen because it is an umbrella term, and even though it encompasses both education and lobbying, it can be a kind of, it can elicit a visceral reaction from some people who are wary about engaging in certain types of advocacy approaches. Um, and by those people, I mean, even within our, you know, our colleagues sometimes are very wary about the, about engaging in lobbying in particular. Um, but oftentimes when you say the word lob advocacy, people think of lobbying or they think of the more um, resistance type of approaches. Education is more of a safe word because it's unbiased information and that's sort of our role as scientists, right? We're, we're making information and we're sharing it with people. Um, so the differences there, I mean, you might educate someone on the extent of research on a specific strategy or policy idea. You might share information about a piece of legislation, but not making specific recommendations. Lobbying is different in that it's very specific to legislation. It's opposing or uh, seeking to support specific pending legislation you might ask a legislator to vote in a certain way. Um, so the key message here is that while all lobbying is, is advocacy, not all advocacy is lobbying. And so advocacy is just much more general in terms of um, providing support for a potential uh, strategy. Um, and so the reason why people are worried about lobbying and the word advocacy in that misnomer is that um, there are regulations that we have to be really cautious about. Um, these primarily affect nonprofits and uh, federally funded researchers, as well as government employees. Um, so essentially, this doesn't mean that you can't lobby. It just means you can't use certain resources to do it. So if you want to call your legislator about a specific issue, do it on your own dime, like your own resources, not your university phone, not your university computer to write them an email to ask them about a bill. Um, and so I think that that's why people get so concerned is because the stakes are kind of high. You could lose your funding as a nonprofit or a researcher, or you could um, lose your job as a government employee. And with government employees, I think it's also an important distinction to make is there are rules and then there are norms. So even though legally government employees are supposed to have the right to freedom of speech and be able to voice uh, their opinions. Um, they're very wary about doing so because part of their training usually is don't interact with officials, just don't do it. Um, and and so it's, it's a really ch challenging area that we're still trying to navigate in the government employee arena. But in any case, I do have some explicit recommendations in a moment about what to do as a federally funded researcher. But in any case, just remember that you are a citizen of this country. Your voice matters. And as a scientist, you have really great information to share. So there are some ways that you can safeguard yourself. Um, and, you know, you're a lot more flexible when you're not on paid time and using your own personal resources. But in any case, um, just think about 
your your ability to impart knowledge that is unique and having that is you know it's a civic right and duty in some ways so recommendations for avoiding the slippery slope particularly if you're on these paid resources is focus on the evidence you know if you don't talk about legislation at all there's no way to really get in trouble at least with the lobbying regulations if you're talking about legislation, make sure you describe it objectively, not your opinion about what to do about it. Um, you describe, so something that we do in the RPC is when we write a policy brief, we might describe the evidence around an issue. So maybe we know that um, greater medical access for kids leaving the juvenile justice system might potentially have some implications for reducing recidivism. That said, we'll say that this bill is trying to provide increased access, but we're not taking a stance on the bill because there might be multiple avenues of getting that done. And this is just one attempt that someone's trying to do. And so that's sort of number three is describing how legislation does or doesn't align with evidence. So again, focusing on objectivity and the evidence, not your opinion. Um, with the researchers receiving federal funding, some do's and don'ts here. You can definitely share your research and its implications. Talk about best practices and successes, especially lawmakers love to hear about um, state successes. If there are communities that have been doing something that has been particularly successful, they love to hear that because it, from a, a lawmaker perspective, states are the laboratories. They experiment with their own policies and we can learn from them at the federal level. Um, and so in that sense, model legislation can also be useful and that's totally acceptable if someone is working on an issue and they've asked you to help identify legislation that has supported that at a state level, that's totally fine, especially when they've asked you for that in a request sort of way. Um, you can also make sure that you're speaking as an individual rather than representing a scientist. So these last couple of do's are more like once the slippery slope gets a little slippier, that's not a word, sorry. <laughs> but um, once the slope gets steeper, um, you can make sure that you're you're talking as an individual. You're not representing your agency. Uh, so for example, I'm not representing Penn State in this conversation when I tell you I want you to vote in this way. Um, so you can voluntarily call using personal resources. So those are dues. What you don't want to do is use certain funds or resources for the next couple of activities. You don't want to, you know, use your university computer or your um, or your conference funding to go talk to a legislator about your opinion about specific legislation. You don't want to pressure government officials with those resources and you don't want to engage in broader activities that take a stance on specific legislation. And so that activity word is pretty key because lobbying isn't defined just by that interaction. It's defined as the, the activities that support it as well. So that can include writing a brief about a piece of legislation. So again, if you're describing it in terms of how it aligns with evidence and not taking a stance, and that's one thing. But if you're writing a piece of, um, this is why you should support this legislation and then sharing it with your professional associations, then that's lobbying. You're engaging them in grassroots lobbying, essentially. And it's not that you can't do that, just don't use your personal resources to, don't use your professional resources to do it. So like here at Penn State, don't use your email, don't use, even if you have another email, don't use the like a tagline saying, you know, such and such, you know, um, you know, research fellow or professor or, you know, or any, mm -hmm. any of that, none of that should be in the tagline and, mm -hmm. you know, you, you can't represent it. You can use your professional degrees, like after your name, you are allowed to do that. So. Yeah, I would use a personal email, for example, you know, your Gmail, not your Penn State email. And even, even though I've emphasized a lot with these, you know, lobbying and how you're, you are able to do that to some extent, um, with the RPC, we explicitly don't engage in lobbying because we recognize that that can be perceived as a bias and we don't want we want to come in to build relationships first and foremost, and we want to meet people where they are. So not trying to push and pressure people, we're just trying to understand what they're working on and how we can strengthen that with scientific evidence. We, we make explicit, so when people ask us to tell, tell us about ourselves, we say, you know, we, we do have a bias. Our bias is that 
you use scientific evidence in your decision making and when you're crafting legislation. So that's mm -hmm. our bias. We don't necessarily, you know, and we want you to use it and use it, you know, and interpret it and understand it. And we're here as a resource to facilitate that process, but we're not going to tell you which, you know, how do you use it or for what purpose necessarily. We're just going to be an interpreter, a knowledge mm -hmm. broker. And so that's the key piece. Yeah. And that level of transparency is really helpful for relationships. Um, so, in terms of what to expect with policy making, I've referred a couple of times to this policy window agenda, uh, and agenda making. Um, I, I think that this resource is particularly helpful. Actually, the original Kingdon book, I think, came out in 1984. This is a revised copy. Um, policy making is not a linear process. What Kingdon did is he essentially researched the policy making process. He interviewed a lot of people and he tried to understand what helps to what helps decision makers make their decisions. And, and so he defined a couple of key concepts, like the agenda is what people are paying attention to. And that is think that can be shifted by things like changes in in uh, Congress. You know, maybe you shift from Republican to Democrat. It can also shift because of national mood. People pay more attention, especially I mentioned tragedies earlier. But also, you know, if there's growing awareness about something like mass incarceration, then that can present what Kingdom would call a policy window because people have started to shift toward that agenda. And there's this brief period of opportunity where we can work on that um, existing uh, policy priority. Um, we also know that uh, the media has an influence in the agenda, um, probably you know, pretty correlated with the national mood. Um, but we, we know that their attention span is pretty brief. So you know, even if they covered Sandy Hook for a couple of weeks, we quickly moved on after there wasn't any movement on the Hill with legislation for any um, policy solutions. And so that closed the policy window. People moved on because there wasn't an acceptable alternative, which is another kingdom word in terms of acceptable solutions. And so essentially that's where we can kind of play a role is helping people to think about what are the different strategies to address those um, issues that they've already made as an agenda. And um, sometimes they already have their alternatives defined and they are just sort of looking for confirmation bias. Am I doing the right thing? Can I share research on this topic to show people that it's a good idea? Other times that they're looking for new innovative ideas on how to address a problem. Um, in any case, another realistic expectation is that most bills die in committee. Only 4% of bills in 2010 became law. And I'm pretty sure that that was um, when we had Democrat president and Democrat Congress. So imagine what it's like when there's gridlock. Um, and the agenda changes rapidly. Um, I, I think I'll get into the committee issue. I think on the next slide. Yeah. So essentially with committees, they are the first step in any legislative process because um, they're Committees are predefined um, groups who have jurisdiction over certain issues. And if a committee such as like the Judiciary Committee is handling sentencing reform, they have to figure out internally among their committee members, is this how we want to approach this bill? It's sort of like a funnel approach to policy making because they don't want to just put all policies on the floor for the vote of the entire legislators before it's been vetted essentially and um and so bills die in committee because sometimes committees don't even look at them you have a committee chair who sort of determines the agenda on the committee is this something we're willing to work on and spend time on or not and um and whenever it does actually make it to the agenda for the committee then they have to review it and take action on it and with that process they'll mark up the bill so maybe they maybe the Democrats want these changes and the Republicans want these changes and they try and come to a compromise through that markup process. Once it um, once the committee um, writes up their report on the bill and have published that report, that's when it goes to the floor for the broader Congress. And this process happens in both chambers. So we've got the House and the Senate who both go through these the same series of steps. And once it's, you know, past committee, then you still have that filtration process of like in the House, you have the 
speaker who sets the agenda in terms of what bills are going to make it to the floor. And if it makes it to the floor, then they might have debate on it. Debate is less likely in the Senate where they try and pass things through something called unanimous consent. Um, but in any case, there it may or may not make it to the floor, even if it's passed committee. And so then they vote on it in the House or the Senate. And after, if they pass it, then it can go to the other chamber, or maybe they're trying to vote on it at the same time. In any case, if it passes both chambers, there's often discrepancies between the statutory language. And at that point, they have to go to conference and figure out what is the final language before it goes to the president for his decision. And then, of course, there's the veto process, which we don't get into at all with the RPC because we are legislative focused. Um, and so avenues for researcher engagement can happen at any of these stages. Um, so as I've mentioned, you know, some some staff are interested in hearing about innovative solutions or alternatives to a particular problem. Um, and sometimes they want to hear of examples from states or communities and how they've been addressing that. So that's something that you can do before committee. Um, during committee, so um, during committee, you might be asked to do things like a hearing or um, or a briefing where you have experts to present or talk about the topic. Um, and the RPC doesn't get into the third bullet in terms of once the there's it's coming to the floor. We're not lobbying for that, but there's potential role for the research community generally in terms of advocacy. Um, so like I don't know if any of you guys are members of APA, but they have these blasts that go out sometimes about bills that are going on the floor. Call your legislator. Um, after it becomes law, there's also room for involvement in terms of how it gets interpreted and implemented or how it gets appropriated or regulated. Um, some of this is a bit more obscure because a lot of that decision making process is still handled by the committee, um, but it's not in their direct control at that point. It's under the control of the executive branch and the agencies to interpret and regulate and things like that. Um, so the different avenues for engagement um, through these processes on the right side of my um, slide, we have policy briefs, which um, must be really concise and easy to read. We usually shoot for about one to two pages and packets full of basically um, lots of key points and cite a bunch of things so that if they want to find more information, they can read about it. But otherwise, we've packed it full of lots of information that helps them to, you know, find more. It's a lead. If they need more information, they can find it with our resources. Um, in any case, you need to make sure there's a plan for dissemination, because if you write it and put it on a website, that doesn't mean the right people are going to get it. Um, with congressional briefings, these are sort of like conference symposium and symposia in terms of, you know, you have a panel of people who are going to talk about a specific topic. Where it differs is that you really have to step back away from the science speak and from getting into the weeds of it and think about your target audience as these legislators who don't have as much scientific training generally. Um, and make sure that you're focused on just a couple of clear take home points so that it's not overwhelming and you're diluting a clear message. Um, and so that can be about the state of the evidence more generally. Um, additionally, we've had success with testimonies at our briefings. Um, uh, te expert testimony is a bit different than the constituent testimony I mentioned earlier. Um, and this happens usually at a legislative hearing, and that's generally planned by like the committee. So they realize that they're, you know, maybe considering a vote on a particular bill or a particular issue. They'll schedule something that is a much more formal process and controlled by Congress. And so they theoretically, they announce their call for experts publicly, but generally they find people that they can trust and they already know. So that's another way that this trust building exercise through the RPC can provide potentially another avenue of engagement because as people start to see us as a trusted resource, then they might ask us to find someone for a testimony. And usually those testimonies are written out on paper and you kind of read it out because people want to make sure that it's, um, they can plan for what you're going to say, whereas congressional briefings are a bit more flexible and it can be hosted by an organization. 
Um, model legislation, I alluded to that earlier. Sometimes it's how states have um, addressed issues. It's written statute. It can be borrowed and reused for other purposes. Um, we have also actually been considering ways to review existing legislation to create a legislative template for evidence-based policy. So that can also be seen as model legislation because you can have statutory language written out that people can recycle and reuse for different purposes. And so that would be, you know, essentially what are the best practices for how to write into, into law the use of evidence. Um, and last is more just outreach and advocacy. You can do that through different organizations with collective action um, or by calling your legislator, or you can try and do more of this needs-based approach where you're trying to build rapport. And with that level of rapport, you might eventually be asked to do some of these other, um, these other activities that are on my slide. Um, so, a couple of key points that I've found useful for working with the, uh, the research network who are working to build capacity are some of these take home points of always cite your resources. You know, it seems intuitive, but you'd be surprised. Sometimes um, people know, you know, I've read, I've read this body of evidence and I know that this is, you know, what works, but legislators lack time to hunt down those resources. And if you want them to trust what you're saying, you need to make sure that you're providing something that they can draw on, not just your word. Um, and maybe if you do have that level of trust with them one day, then that is different. But if you're working to build relationships, you need to make sure that you're, you're prepared with um, the things that they can draw on. Um, it's always important to respect the staff. Realistically, that's who you're working with, not your legislators. I've been working in this role for about a year and a half now, and I think I've shaken the hands of about four legislators so far. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, also, make sure to be prepared. Um, and with that, you want to make sure you're sticking to a to message. And, um, you know, to some extent, if you're working to build relationships, you want to try and get to know that person as well. But if you're if you're there for a specific purpose, make sure you have your materials to share. Um, maybe you've got printed out printed out a summary or whatever policy brief you want to talk about and stick to that because they can only retain so much in that 15 minute meeting. Um, also be flexible. This is something that I'm really glad we prepared our network for because um, uh, even at the rapid response event, we had one meeting where we thought we were going to talk about one topic and ended up talking about a different topic. And so curveballs are not unusual. And part of it is that the policy arena is so dynamic and changing so quickly that you just have to be prepared to talk about um, different issues. But that's part of the beauty of having our rapid response network is that we have a team of people going in and so it's not just one person who's expected to be an expert on all these different things, but they also have familiarity with different topics and we can look to follow up with greater details later on. So it can just be a conversation with action steps. Either way, just don't get thrown off if you're, you know, something random happened. Oh, there was another curveball. We thought we were scheduled with one staffer and ended up talking to a totally different staffer who had no familiarity with our organization at all. So just be prepared for curveballs because uh, things change. And mostly, if you're building relationships, make sure to express gratitude. It goes a long way. Um, and so that's all of the material that I have. And I feel like I've done a lot of talking. And so I wanted to open it up now to others to hear from you guys and your thoughts. And, and I know we're at time. So if anyone's yeah. interested, please feel free to follow up. Um, so Taylor's email there or um, my email, you can find on the Prevention Center website. Uh, happy to continue the conversation. So thank you for those of you who have to go. We totally recognize it. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now, um, uh, we, uh, <coughs> thank you. Oh, 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 thank
Um, so I'm here till tonight, and we'll go to DC tomorrow for the P15 meeting. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Yeah. So it's good seeing you.